The book is about fishing, family, the beauty found in Montana, and brotherhood. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Read the Right Thing Book Reviews. I'm Eric. Thanks so much for watching. This is the channel where I review books that I'm reading, and the goal is to help you find the right thing to read for you. So once again, thanks for tuning in. Norman McLean was an American author as well as professor at the University of Chicago. After he retired from teaching, he began his career as an author. His most popular book is A River Runs Through It and Other Stories. In the 1990s, Robert Redford adapted this short story into a film. And I've seen the movie many times. In fact, I've probably watched it dozens of times before I ever read the short story. Growing up, it was one of my dad's favorite movies and probably one of the first movies we ever bought on DVD or VHS. I read the short story I want to say about 10 years ago and just recently decided to read it again and also do a review. McLean was born in Iowa, but spent most of his youth in Missoula, Montana. There are some interesting facts about McLean's life that I learned from his Wikipedia page. He attended Dartmouth College and took poetry from Robert Frost. He was also editor of the school paper, and his successor as editor was Theodore Geisel, or better known as Dr. Seuss. McLean said that Theodore was the craziest guy he'd ever met. A River Runs Through It was first published in 1976. It's an autobiographical fiction novella about the author's family and upbringing. There will also be some spoilers in this review, so if you haven't seen the movie or read the book, there's your warning. Norman and his younger brother Paul were homeschooled by their father, the Reverend John McLean. They were taught solely reading, writing, and fly fishing. Unsurprisingly, Norman became an English professor and Paul a reporter for the paper. The first line of the book tells you exactly where their family values lies. In our family, there was no clear line between religion and fly fishing. I love McLean's direct and poetic style. He sums up the nature of their family in just one sentence. I know families that are defined by a few of their interests. The McLeans are defined by their religion and fly fishing. The book is about fishing, family, the beauty found in Montana, and brotherhood. McLean took his own childhood memories and a few events from adulthood to forge an American classic. Although it's about a family, it's mostly a tale of two brothers, highlighting their differences as well as their similarities. While one brother is ascending, the other is spiraling. Norman lives in Wolf Creek, Montana with his wife Jessie and her family. Norman's life is fairly stable, while Paul lives a life of fishing, drinking, gambling, and brawling. Paul dates an Indian woman, and often ends up drunk in jail after bar brawls. Throughout the book, Norman ruminates on how he can help his younger brother. He loves and is loyal to his brother, but you can sense that there is a sibling rivalry. The two brothers are also very different, polar opposites in some ways. Paul is energetic and charming, while Norman is stable, but somewhat duller in comparison. Paul was the nonconformist rebel of the family and community. Norman writes that Paul had two purposes in life, to fish and not to work. The two brothers were also competitive. They were tough backcountry fishermen, but also understood that they were chasing grace and beauty in life through fishing. The goal was not just to catch fish, but to become a true artist. And art doesn't come easy. They both took these religious lessons from their father and crafted their own beliefs and lifestyle out of those lessons. The story is very similar to the film in that it gives a brief history of their childhood, the homeschooling, church, and learning to fly fish from the Presbyterian father. Here's something just from page two. Even so, in a typical week of our childhood, Paul and I probably received as many hours of instruction in fly fishing as we did in all other spiritual matters. After my brother and I became good fishermen, we realized that our father was not a great fly caster, but he was accurate and stylish and wore a glove on his casting hand. As he buttoned his glove in preparation to give us a lesson, he would say, it is an art that is performed on a four count rhythm between 10 and two o'clock. As a Scot and a Presbyterian, my father believed that man by nature was a mess and had fallen from an original state of grace. Somehow, I early developed the notion that he had done this by falling from a tree. As for my father, I never knew whether he believed God was a mathematician, but he certainly believed God could count, and that only by picking up God's rhythms 
were we able to regain power and beauty. Unlike many Presbyterians, he often used the word beautiful. After he buttoned his glove, he would hold his rod straight out in front of him, where it trembled with the beating of his heart. Although it was eight and a half feet long, it weighed only four and a half ounces. It was made of split bamboo cane from the far off Bay of Tonkin. It was wrapped with red and blue silk thread, and the wrappings were carefully spaced to make the delicate rod powerful, but not so stiff it could not tremble. Always, it was to be called a rod. If someone called it a pole, my father looked at him as a sergeant in the United States Marines would look at a recruit who had just called a rifle a gun. The story really gets going when Norm's loser, pathetic brother-in-law, Neil, visits from California. Norman is given a task from his wife to take Neil fishing, to somehow help him out in life through fishing. I assume that Neil's sister and mom figured some good male bonding could help Neil in life. Neil acts like a big shot from California, but it is apparent that he's pretty much a loser mama's boy. Neil isn't much interested in fly fishing, as he would rather drink and shack up with a hooker in town. He's lost in the world. He doesn't know how to fish, and he clearly is not interested in going. Paul and Norman take Neil fishing, but it's a complete bust. It's too hot to catch anything, and they soon realize that they have lost Neil and his hooker friend. When they finish up their fishing and go back to the car, they realize that not only did Neil and the hooker drink all of the beer, but they also fell asleep naked in the sun and are burnt to an absolute crisp. I've never understood why, but Norman gets in trouble for this. It always bothered me in the movie how Norman's wife and Neil's mom blamed Norman and not Neil. But we all know men who can do no wrong in the eyes of their family. The son-in-law always takes the blame. In order to wipe that terrible day off the books, Paul and Norman decide to go fishing with their father. It would end up being the last time that they fished with Paul. They watched Paul reel in a fish and knew they were watching a great artist. Soon after, Paul was killed in a back alley fight. It's a devastating blow to the family, and I don't think any of them quite understood Paul. Rebels are hard to understand. Why did Paul refuse all of the attempts of help? This story is Norman trying to understand what actually happened. The ending is as beautiful, haunting, and melancholic of an ending as you will find in any book. Norman's father often asked him questions about Paul's death, asking him if he could tell him any more details. And this is the last paragraphs. After a long time, he came with something he must have wanted to ask from the first. Do you think it was just a stick up and foolishly he tried to fight his way out? You know what I mean? That it wasn't connected with anything in his past? The police don't know, I said. But do you? He asked, and I felt the implication. I've said I've told you all I know. If you push me far enough, all I really know is that he was a fine fisherman. You know more than that, my father said. He was beautiful. Yes, I said. He was beautiful. He should have been. You taught him. My father looked at me for a long time. He just looked at me. So this was the last he and I ever said to each other about Paul's death. Indirectly, though, he was present in many of our conversations. Once, for instance, my father asked me a series of questions that suddenly made me wonder whether I understood even my father, whom I felt closer to than any man I have ever known. You like to tell stories, don't you? He asked, and I answered, yes, I like to tell stories that are true. Then he asked, after you have finished your true story sometime, why don't you make up a story and the people to go with it? Only then will you understand what happened and why. It is those we live with and love and should know who elude us. Now, nearly all those I loved and did not understand when I was young are dead, but I still reach out to them. Of course, now I'm too old to be much of a fisherman. And now, of course, I usually fish the big waters alone, although some friends think I shouldn't. Like many fly fishermen in western Montana where the summer days are almost arctic in length, I often do not start fishing until the cool of the evening. Then in the arctic half-light of the canyon, all existence fades to a being with my soul and memories and sounds of the big Blackfoot River and a four-count rhythm and the hope that a fish will rise. Eventually, all things merge into one and a river runs through it. The river was cut by the world's great flood and runs over rocks from the basement of time. On some of the rocks are timeless raindrops. Under the rocks are the words, and some of the words are theirs. I am haunted by waters. So there it is. Honestly, I think that's one of the most powerful endings to any book, movie, album, any piece of art that I've ever 
have the pleasure of reading or experiencing. And Redford also really captures that in the movie. His narration is just incredible. McLean writes about fishing and these relationships beautifully and poetically and sadly. It's full of religious symbols and metaphors and beautiful descriptions of nature and fishing. To the McLeans, fishing wasn't just fishing, it was an art form. It was also how those men connected. A river wasn't just a river, but God's grace in tangible form with rocks, mud, water, and trout. Norman wrestles with that question of why do those who need the most help refuse to accept it? I think it's also him working working through and coming to terms with death and mortality. Norman is the last man standing. A lot of the books and music and art I've consumed this year contemplates our mortal existence. From Springsteen to this book, I found reflective narrators contemplating life when they are the last person living from their groups of friends and family. From other books I've reviewed like On Bullfighting to The Perfect Storm to watching Springsteen on stage, or Norman McLean fish a river. These writers, musicians, they're contemplating their own mortality. It's interesting, two years ago, all of the books I read seemed to share a common theme that entropy and chaos prevail in the human life. While I think this year I've seen narrators learning to cope with their own mortality. A River Runs Through It is a story of fishing and tragedy. It's a tribute to Montana, Brothers, Cold Beer, and Fly Fishing. This novella was definitely the right thing for me. If you're a fan of the movie, I highly recommend that you read the book. If you like contemplative books about nature or fishing or brotherhood, then you should definitely read this book as well. So that was my review of Norman MacLean's novella, A River Runs Through It. I'm sure I missed something, so if you've read this novella, please let me know what you thought about it in the comments. And there's also a few other stories in this book that someday I would like to read and also review. But so far, I've just read A River Runs Through It. Thanks for watching this video. If you found this review helpful, please hit that like and subscribe button. Or if you know someone who would enjoy this video, please send it to them. Thank you for tuning in. And as always, read the right thing.